Okay, I think uh, we're uh, ready to start. Um, let me first introduce uh, myself and, and Diana, the speaker. My name is Joaquin Delgado. Uh, I'm the director of engineering at uh, OnQ uh, Verizon. OnQ is a internet and mobile TV um, product that we will be launching soon. Um, interestingly, I'm, I lead the group that does advertising over the, uh, of the internet for internet TV as well as recommender systems. I'm going to talk today about some of the learnings that we've had with respect to the intersection of machine learning and, and search and kind of commonalities that um, we've tried to address uh, with a, a, a open source product that we're, or proof of concept that we're launching. This, this is just the legal stuff uh, that lawyers want to see. You guys can read it yourselves. Um, so I'd like to start with talking a little bit about the, the words that have been used to describe um, what, I, what I believe in general um, a, 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 the, the, the retrieval problem of, of fetching uh, data. You know, we have heard, um, obviously, the word search is used everywhere. So search, what does search mean, really? And how does it differentiate from information retrieval, which is the original kind of uh, nemesis of search? And what it, what, how is it related to machine learning? So a little bit of that as background. So in general, search is uh, like a method for solving what I called, or it's what is called constraint satisfaction problem. So the objective is really to find. So search is the, this action to find all possible solutions, right, uh, given a set of constraints. And if you think about it in, in terms of uh, the traditional search as we know it, uh, the objects would be documents and the queries would be the constraints and the variables would be the, the fields that you're, you're searching on. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily imply ranking or scoring. It's optional and sometimes rank, ranking is needed to find optimal or faster uh, uh, the results in this space that you're searching on. Uh, I'll give you an example of a generic search problem, a constraint satisfaction problem, would be the N queen problem. You want to put on a checkboard uh, N number of queens and so that each of the queens cannot uh, interfere or, or eat, eat each other. So it is a uh, problem that is not easy to solve. In fact, as you can see here, the number of possible solutions and then the number of optimal solutions uh, grow exponentially. And um, Therefore, the, as the space of, that you're looking at and you're searching increases, you need op uh, optional scoring or ways to, um, to weight what possible uh, solutions are more important or more faster to reach or are optimal in terms of the number of, of operations you do to find the solution. Um, if you map it back to what we usually talk to as search or refer to as search, it's really more the information retrieval uh, point of view, which is, yes, it is search. There's some constraints. There's some uh, results that will satisfy those constraints. But then the scoring or ranking is really applied to the domain of text. And that's the traditional information retrieval, uh, you know, nemesis, the, 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 it was born as that field that would be able to rank and score text in a way that would be more uh, efficient and also would mean more for humans. It would be more relevant uh, ranking than anything else. So in, in that sense, the solution that uh, information retrieval uh, came up with is really representing uh, documents a bag of words and then ultimately as vectors in an in a n-dimensional space where each term, in, you know, most of the people are uh, familiar with this, uh, the TF-IDF model would look at the term frequencies in the document with respect to the query terms and, and the inverse document frequency with, with is uh, how, how common are terms across all the documents and then uh, weigh them differently. This creates a weight so that when a query term is posed, I could find uh, more the distance between the, the query represented as a document and all the documents in the space, in the solution space, uh, and then calculate the kind of a distance, a cosine similarity. There's other, other approaches like language models and also uh, probabilistic ranking, but all of them try to produce a uh, model uh, that would mimic uh, relevancy in, in the sense that it would try to find 
what, how close is the query uh, in terms of text similarity to the uh, documents that I'm trying to search. Um, machine learning, which is also used for solving the search or retrieval problem, particularly for ranking, is a little bit different, right? We, we particularly, uh, we're, when we talk about supervised learning, uh, we have uh, the task of predicting labels for an unseen object based on the training of uh, instances of, of that we know the labels for. So basically, it's an algorithm or a set of algorithms that you, you put as input a set of instances, whether those are documents, images, sounds, whatever they are, you extract features, you run them through this learning algorithms, also feed them the labels for those instances, and it creates a predictive model. Now, interestingly, this approach has been used for search and the information retrieval uh, way by saying, okay, can I compute relevancy using a predictive model? But it's more generic than that because we know that machine learning can be used to classify pretty much any problem in the space of having uh, the ability to extract feature vectors and then predict on unseen or new objects that I haven't uh, um, seen before, using this predictive model to generalize and, cl and, and perform that classification task uh, by similarity with the instances that have been learned. Um, so, and, and when you do that with the task of producing a number instead of a label, it's called a regression task, uh, you effectively you're not only predicting, you're really predicting a probability or a number that represents uh, a, 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 in, a, in a scale um, the, a, a score that can be used for ranking. So effectively regression is a way to use predictive modeling for ranking. I'll come back to why this is interesting in the, in the scope of this talk. Uh, this is just an example of what a model would be. In this case we're uh, uh, talking about uh, logistic regression that uh, effectively is a better way if you have some thresholds or an, uh, a binary classification to approximate uh, a set of instances you have in, in a space. Uh, you have probably have, have seen look, linear regression which is really looking at in a linear model just a, uh, uh, the, the distance between the instances in a, in a linear uh, a line in, in the, in the, in the uh, space. Here it's a little bit different because it uses more approximation of a curve and then it, it doesn't exceed the threshold that you're looking for to not exceed. Um, but search is not restricted to text. If you come back to the original constraint satisfaction problem, we see that all over the place, right? We see it in database systems where you effectively a SQL query is a statement of constraint. You see it in games, uh, in AI systems like the queen, uh, you know, even chess, the way chess is played is, is, is a really a search in a, a, a variety of space of solutions of the different moves that a person can perform. Um, in e-commerce systems as well, because now the task is not to rank based on the similarity of text, but other factors, such as distance. If you're doing mobile e-commerce, you want to show the products that are closer by or maybe, you know, geographic if you're doing a search on a, um, let's say on a Trulia or any of the other uh, uh, real estate websites. So now the objective or the ranking function is no longer uh, the traditional information retrieval TFIDF. Recommender Systems now introduces a yet another factor of um, uh, user similarity as well as contextual similarity. For example, nowadays Recommender Systems use things like time of the day or effectively where in which website, in which section of your app is the recommendation being produced. So you no, no longer just have uh, values of, of data points or features that are, per, uh, that are related to the objects you're recommending. You also have other features that you add to the process of learning that can allow you to uh, score things uh, differently. And finally, advertising, my favorite topic, is really matching or being able to show the right ad to the to the right user at the right time, it's a confluence of many things. People uh, talk about advertising as a search problem, but it's also a uh, economic problem because you want to maximize returns. And if you're a publisher, you want to maximize the amount of money you can make. If you're an advertiser, you're trying to bid for, a, uh, for showing an ad that is relevant to that user, that user in particular, and, and being able to get a return in terms of clicks or conversions. So there is a whole marketplace bidding um, 
uh, ecosystem that really is a different way to rank, uh, but it's still doing pretty much search in the sense that it has to weigh down and, and, and retrieve a set of ads that are relevant to the user prior to ranking. Um, so why is this, uh, for me, very interesting? Because it turns out that when I, in my experience, every single one of these um, problems have been ultimately tried or solved in, to some extent with something like a search engine. Um, why? Let's say, why are search engines so powerful and can be used to attack most of these problems? Even if you have your documents or your information in traditional databases or NoSQL databases, a lot of the times we represent and we use either Elasticsearch or Solar or some of these search engines to perform these tasks. First of all, because they're widely available, you have Elasticsearch, Solar, they're open source, they're fast and scalable, they're a distributed system that can you know, you load and char the indexes and be able to do it at mass scale. And it integrates well. You can just suck the data, get out the data from the different repositories, and then load them and represent them in a very generic way in JSON or that represents documents and fields, and, and it's, it's very use, easy to use. Um, what's the problem, though? So search engines were originally designed, and let's not forget about that, Lucene, which is the underlying um, uh, engine or, or library that is used in both Elasticsearch and Solar, were originally designed for information retrieval. So the scoring mechanisms that therefore it contains is, is very much tailored to the original problem of text. Um, sometimes, and I've seen this again and again, people use, uh, let's say, the search engine as one face, retrieve the documents, retrieve whatever the objects they, they want to um, find, and then do a second face of, uh, of actually scoring. So let me illustrate that. So in information retrieval, a ranking, the original ranking functions right now used in Elasticsearch, just to come back to the uh, why we may not use this scoring and why it may not fit our, our, our objective, is again very much using the TF-IDF model. Yes, it has something different. You can do boosting, so that's why you can do boosting on some fields or some specific uh, words. And you can also do normalization based on size of the document. Um, and, and so on and so forth. But in essence, it is looking at term frequency, document frequency, inverse document frequency. So what is the two-flex uh, face approach that typically um, you know, we perform? Filter and rank. So what is the problem with this? Um, many of the times, the way we filter retrieves a large number of, of documents that, well, we can do some scoring on, but if we do a complex scoring that requires, say, for example, a machine learning model, then there's the alternative of doing the retrieval based on some proxy score. Maybe the original text scoring engine would help us retrieve a subset. Remember, we have these constraints that you want to follow. And then off of those top K, we do the ranking. What happens here is that when you have constraints such as budget for advertising, or you really want to look at that particular um, uh, relevant uh, recommendation that you want to show to the user and you won't know until that point in time, then figuring out what is the best top K based on an algorithm that is not the one suited for the task becomes a problem. And therefore, there's always this idea or kind of the, 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 uh, the best case scenario is that, oh, can we, can we marry those things? Can we marry the search as a retrieval function and still be able to use something like machine learning that is generic enough to produce the scores in such a way that I don't have to do this two-phase approach. So we thought about this problem. And we thought about how to solve this problem, and, um, which is applicable to any of these systems, advertising system, recommender systems, um, and so on and so forth. So what we came uh, uh, to do, and again, this is still a pretty much a just a disclaimer, a prototype, and it's a, it's a proof of concept, but you will be able to go down and download it and play with it after this, is, well, there is a concept of a plugin within um, um, Elasticsearch, and Solar has the same concept for scoring. So yes, it's not something new to be able to score based on some function that you, you determine. What we thought it was cool is, what if you can just plug in any machine learning algorithm? 
And what if you can use the machine learning algorithms that are existing and available for us today? And then we created this uh, kind of three-phase approach where you can create an Elasticsearch index off of any document that represents your, in your instances that you're trying to work on. You can train a supervised learning algorithm uh, from that subset or a subset of those instances. And then it generates automatically a plugin for you so that you can use Elasticsearch to you do any constraints that you want to do to narrow down the set of, of valid um, uh, instances, but it also does that scoring based on that machine learning algorithm you selected to do the scoring for you. So in other words, it tries to do what, I guess, in, an internal scoring based on a model that is uh, machine learning based instead of the uh, TF-IDF information retrieval based. Uh, so I'll let it, uh, Diana show you the steps and also a demo. Thanks. So here we did a couple implementations of the ML scoring with the idea that Joaquin was mentioning. So, I mean, this is still very rough code. It's mostly the interesting idea of kind of hacking your search engine to use it as your online evaluator for your data, which typically people don't do, so you save some amount of code in the service. So the idea is that you first have your data, some sort of data that you're going to use offline and it has labels, then you train it and also index it in your search engine. So you could have all of it, you train, create your model. And then once you have that, you have to be able to serialize this ML model and be able to load it up later into your ML scoring plugin. So you have at the end of the results of the, this demo, you have uh, the instances in the sense the data set in Elasticsearch loaded, and then a second part is the ML, the machine learning scoring plugin, which has, which takes in the serialized ML model and has, it creates a binary, sort of like the script that Elasticsearch takes in and can do any kind of evaluation. So you could take your model that you train in on, let's say, an SVM, then you serialize and you learn the weights and the intercepts, and then you apply that, create the binary, and then it creates a plugin. And one of the th interesting things is that during query time, let's say at online evaluation, the, this is a very specific to Elasticsearch, you have this concept of passing functions where you can pass a script, and they have various ways of passing script in different languages. They have native, which uh, it compiles in Java because um, Elasticsearch is all implemented in Java off of Lucene. Uh, but it also supports other scripting JVM languages like Groovy. And the implementation we have shown here, we are using Java. Um, so this is an example of a query that you could then, at the, at the query level, you could pass in other, the whole idea that Joaquin was mentioning, the constrained search, constrained, constrained search part of it, where you could, for example, um, do a, you have a spot where you can only do certain kinds of advertisement based on, let's say, this is a category that you should only show to uh, adults and that are a certain age, and then you satisfy that. So during evaluation, you would only evaluate it into the instances that match that. So it allows you to do the filtering plus the ranking using the scripting score. So and some of the support that we tried out is like, okay, so you could, um, what about if we implement this, you could train any model in Weka and then load it as the binary that I mentioned. So during runtime and evaluation time, you pretty much have a trained Weka model that evaluates your, your score for, for your instances in Elasticsearch. And then we said, okay, so the problem with Weka is that you could only uh, train on models that fit in a single machine. So what about uh, trying the same idea with Spark? So you could train a model in a lot of data and then serialize the model and then somehow load it up. So during evaluation time, Elasticsearch uses the train model in Spark. And right now, it only works for linear models. And there's some details on that on the code on why that is. But just by trying out the implementation in Weka and Spark, it doesn't mean that you're constrained to just using these two. It's just the idea of being able to somehow represent and serialize and load the binary code in Elasticsearch JVM. You could pretty much do any library in machine learning, any trained model. And um, so that's, that's part of it. So let me show you a little bit right now uh, a demo of the code. I mean, right now, let's see. Actually, let me show the next slide first. So let's see. 
So here we have um, the way we configure. We're, we're taking this data set from UC Irvine, the UC Irvine ML repository. There's this data that has the census data. And it's a classification problem where it's trying to predict uh, either uh, the probability of someone making more than 50,000K a year, which is this last number here, zero or either one. And you have the, all the different features. And as you see, the features are either numerical or they are categorical. Uh, for example, H is obviously numerical. Then you have work class, which is either state government or self-employed or other. Um, so we take in this data and create to train the model. And I'm going to show you the Spark example. So here, the way we implement it, there's this configuration file where you specify here the data set options, where the data, data resides, then columns where you can select a subset. But maybe you don't want to work with all the features, so you select some of them. So for example, here, this education num, we're not using that. We're just using education. So you select a subset, subset of them. Then we have all the other trainer options. So here we select the classifier Spark logistic regression. And there's other ones that are implemented, for example, Spark um, um, linear regression. There's also SVM, among others. Uh, and then specify sort of all your traditional supervised training tasks, the training percentage, so you save 20% for testing. Uh, then you want to do cross-validation. And here, model file name is the custom serialization that we did for Spark. But for Weka, you could save it as um, the Weka ARFF file, which is just loaded. But for this case, we save it as a JSON file. And for linear models, the nice thing is that all you need is just the weights and the intercepts, and you could calculate it on real time. And here are just the elastic search options where you load uh, which point the clusters. You point all the details of your host name, the name, and create the, the name of the index. And here are specific uh, to Spark options. We're selecting the logistic regression model type. It's not a regression because this is a classification task. And we are, uh, there's no need for a binary threshold because it's already 0 and 1. But here we can specify custom things about the particular classifier here. For example, the number of iterations for the gradient descent, we just set 30 so that we finish on time. So then the regularization parameter and blah, 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 and the number of classes. And here are some other details of specific to configuring your Spark cluster. Here's, we're just running it locally here, the driver memory. Um, so let me show you then. We're going to fire up Elasticsearch cluster locally here. And then I'm going to show you that we don't have a index here. It's local. That is empty right now. You'll see here that I don't have anything stored here. So the first part that I'm running here, I pre-compile already the binaries here because to make it work with Spark, you need to make a fat jar, and it takes a while to get all the dependencies in Spark. So it's all pre-compiled. But you could try it out in the code. So we just run the, run it here. With the property file that I showed you with all the configurations for the training and indexing and where the data lives. So I hit this, and then here's running. And if we look at here, it's creating all the index for the data. It's creating blah, blah, blah. You see education, hours per week, blah, blah. And I think right now it's firing Spark. And then we should be able to see here the local host uh, Spark UI. And as you see here, um, stages 0 to 3 is where you're loading the data into an RDD. And you could, at some point, read it also directly from Elasticsearch. But right now, it's just reading it locally from the CSV. Then here's running all the tree aggregate are the specific iterations during the SGD. Um, optimization algorithm for, for the logistic regression. So it's running it. And I guess it's finished right now because I wanted to finish on time. <laughs> and here we have the results. And the results are OK ish because we wanted to finish on time. So we didn't let it run for too long. And you see here the results of the training precision recall. And here we take a look at the data in, 
Elasticsearch, actually, we can take a look here. We can see that an index got created called demo, which is what I specified in the properties file, and it has the number of documents indexed there. And it doesn't index right now. Whoops. If we take a look at the data here, you can see all the columns that we selected, and obviously it doesn't have the probability because that's our prediction that we are target variable. So we could foresee in a production environment you wouldn't have that score, and that's the actual score you're looking to use for your ranking. So now the second step of this is once we have created, we need to uh, create the plugin, which is another jar file with all the dependencies that get with the binaries. And we need to install it into Elasticsearch. So some of this is not documented. Some of it is documented in Elasticsearch. So it's reading through the source code to figure out what is going on. But um, here I'm looking at So here I'm passing the precompile. Okay. Right here. Uh, so I'm installing here the search predictor is the plugin, and I'm passing the file that I'm already precompiled this. Uh, passing the plugin that got created after you pass in some of the configurations here. That once you create the model, it points to where the model lives. This is the model file that got generated. These are all the mappings, so we know how to handle the types. For example, you saw some things are strings, some things are double. And the specific uh, Spark um, trainer. So here we installed the plugin. So we installed it. And then, as you see, some of the files that got generated, demo model is the serialized Spark model that got trained. And to make it work with Spark, right now it only works with linear model because I can, I looked at the the source code in MLlib, and you can extract the weights, the intercept, and that's enough for a linear model to do a classification. So then you don't really need to run a Spark context in your Elasticsearch because it gets messy. So all you need is just this data. But other things I'm kind of investigating is how can you, if you have models that are distributed, how can you have an Elasticsearch and also have a Spark cluster running and do the evaluation, or maybe not? But the general idea is that you could train on Spark and then evaluate on Elasticsearch. So once we install the plugin, I need to actually restart the Elasticsearch cluster. And then notice here when I restart it, there's going to be something, it's going to say plugin, something plugin. And this is the plugin we just installed here. Something, something plugin. And then we could do the query here. I think this is too small, right? So I'm going to do the structure query. Is the query that we showed here in the presentation, which is using here the search predictor plugin that we asked. And I'm just matching all just interest and time in the index here. We call the demo. So right now it's evaluating for all the documents. It's fairly fast. And here you see the score, either 1 or 0. But since this is ranking by order, I guess it took all the documents that match one because it only shows the top five right now, just the way the plugin head end works. But then it shows you here, I can, as a debug here, I'm pr printing out all the conversions of the vector. This is the actual feature vector that gets generated, that gets passed to the, wet, the weight multiplication for your linear model. And I think this is it for the demo. And I think the code is still very raw, but it's just the concept of having um, the proof of concept that this could work, just kind of hacking your Elasticsearch and not using it for the intended purpose. You're just reusing the scoring function instead of your traditional TFIDF. You could pass in a custom function of anything. And this custom, custom function is really could be a model, because at the end of the day, when you have a supervised trained model, it's just a function that got learned. So you could just apply the function and use it. And the way it's implemented right now, there's certain things that could be changed a, bit, a little bit different. Uh, for example, is the way right now is like loading the model every time you do a query. But if you had 
a model that you're very sure about it, you could hard code the values in there, the actual weights, so you don't have to load and serialize, deserialize the model every time. Uh, and then that's really fast. But what you lose is that the nice thing about this, once you install the plugin, you could swap the model file as long as your features doesn't change. Then you want to relearn the weights, that's fine. Then you don't have to reinstall the plugin, and it just works. And part of it, the, I guess, what is a bit, uh, part of this work is a bit, um, if you see the code, there's a Scala code doing all the Spark, Spark abstractions. And there's this uh, Java code to do the plugin. And you can see the interoperation of having Scala code that gets called in in the plugin. And it works, it just works. So that's, that's it. I don't know if you guys have any questions. Oh, we do have some potential issues that we want to discuss that. Uh, okay, so this is, as, as, as I mentioned, this is a bit of a hack. There might be uh, performance issues if your search space is very large, and that's why you want to do the constrained search approach where you limit the amount of documents that's going to evaluate and pass through this custom function. Uh, that's one way of doing it. And other things that are definitely very not, not, not for production operations is that how do you do versioning and binary, binary com compatibility? Because if you change your plugin and your data, data model changes, things get very messy. And at the end of the day, you're really changing your database at the database layer. You're really going really low level. Instead of having a service shielding you off of that, you're really changing the, the, your database. So that's things that you want to consider. But it's trade-offs that you want to do. But it's just uh, it's an interesting idea that we explored. And um, if you have any questions right now, we're open. Go ahead. Um, how do you guys, are, I presume you guys are running uh, uh, for, for what you're doing, because you're partitioning across multiple machines. And it would only apply to that chart, but it would use the machine learning model that was learned. And it would not use the TFIDF score. So it basically replaces the TFIDF score and it uses the score from the model to predict the actual rank. Now here it was very simple because it was one and zero, but in regression task it could be a probability, it could be anything. So, um, so like each chart runs the model? On that set, um, yes. The, uh, the way it works is the plugin, we're really just leveraging all the work that Elasticsearch and um, Mm -hmm. Lucene has done. Yeah, and cloud and search. So you get it for free. They do all the optimizations, and there's this kind of score multiplication that they already do, anyways, for retrieving documents. It's the exact same. Instead, you're kind of injecting this custom function to. Right. Yeah. So but the cool thing is that it could really apply any machine learning algorithm that you, you, you want. Right? Uh, I, I don't see why it doesn't work. I mean, I, I kind of prototyped this, and it, was, it works. I, if there's uh, something with JVM, it, we could get it. Um, it's just a matter of, matter of serialization. And there's things like Jython that you could do and pickle it and Jython, and it should work. I mean, this was really rough, but it works. <laughs> it's just. OK. Any other question? Yeah, go ahead. So but we're not tackling the problem of feature engineering. Anyways, you need to do that to create your models. One interesting thing that I did not mention is that not all the features need to be in, in the document. So you could pass some of the features as part of your query. So if you have a real-time feature that you don't have it as part of the document, a good example of that is in advertising. We use a lot time of day or, you know, because depending on the time of day, people have different moods and, and appetite for advertising or not. So that would be a, a query-based feature. But still the model, you can train it with that feature. It's just that it's not part of the document. It can still use as an input and then evaluate the, the learning. So the, the problem of feature engineering, but you could use any, any real uh, machine learning algorithms if you want to use, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, part of the challenge is also, if you are doing additional, do at, at query time, if your uh, feature vector is not in the same space of space as in the same dimensions, if they have normalization or some conversion transformation, if they don't have it, you need to add it in your in your the predictor engine to in the binary. And it, of course, it takes longer. But if you have simple things that you just take in the data as it is, 
uh, you could do that. And as Joaquin mentioned, that's actually something that you could do. Uh, you train on a document that has an additional column or feature dimension, like, as you said, the time of the day, that uh, at query time, your documents don't have that, but in your training set, you do. You could fetch that from the service and get that and add it in as part of your query and then still get the results. So it's quite flexible in that sense. It's not just restricted to the feature vectors that are in your document set in Elasticsearch. You could add in additional dimensions. Some of these algorithms also handle very well uh, missing values. So that still applies. If missing values are handled by the original algorithm, this would handle it as well. Because we're not reinventing the algorithm. Anything else? Okay. Oh, one more. So we, we created an API that then you can implement uh, with any function, as you said, that, that takes an instance. It's very similar to the concept of instance evaluation by Weka or by even by, a, by any of these machine learning algorithms. It just takes an instance and then communicate. And in that instance, the, the fields could be read from the document, which is what we do, or it could be read from the document and the query and then pass to the evaluator, and then it returns back the score. And then that score is what the internal plugin returns back to Elasticsearch. Well, if you want, I can show you a little bit uh, the interface. I mean, it's still very, I guess, you still need to work a bit on the documentation to be more useful. Uh, well, of time, I mean, this is available on GitHub, so you guys will be able to. Uh, yeah, so for example, here, this is the plugin which, this is the script that gets called in by Elasticsearch. It extends this um, abstract interface, abstract search script. And part of the trick is that you need to, it has this function doc, which is what it gets returned for every query. And what you need to make sure is that when you get the doc, it's obviously JSON, and JSON doesn't have order. So you have to make sure to be able to get your features in order, because you trained it, for example, age is, the, is in the zeroth, and I don't know, work class is two and things could be swapped. So this is part of it, what we do to make sure that things are in order and provided and it's the same input output for your training and testing, I mean evaluation. Um, so that's mostly it. I mean, so this is not, not, not meant to be used in production, but it's just a proof of the idea of uh, not using search as they intended, but. Well, not at Verizon. Um, but obviously, um, the, idea, the idea, this is more of a generalization of an implementation that came that is used elsewhere and that is, is being used in a in large e-commerce site that I cannot talk about. Thank you. Thank you.